Um, Elliot uh, is head of climate strategy and is going to be talking about sustainable Bitcoin protocol. Uh, hey everybody, how are we all doing? We're still foggy? Was that not the coolest presentation like of the entire conference, right? Like Again, claps for Phil, for the Gridless team. Um, I'll, tr I'll try to be quick. Um, my name is Elliot David. I'm the head of climate strategy at Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol. I'll probably repeat a lot of the things that were just said in the previous presentation. Um, I also just want to take a moment and say I don't think we all appreciate how, how impactful this gridless model is going to be over the next five years. I think, personally, it is going to be the single largest driver of sustainable development of any technology in the world. So I think we're, like, we're all going to remember this conference. Uh, so yeah, I guess a little bit about me really quick. Uh, this will help you know how little I know about stuff. So you should fact check me on everything. You should not trust everything I say. Um, the least important part of the presentation. Uh, but I've been in the climate energy space for about a decade or so. Clean energy infrastructure development in uh, Global South, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin South America. Um, spent some time at the US Department of Energy, at, working for President Clinton at his foundation. Um, do a bit of work in Rwanda. Anyway, boring stuff. Um, today we're going to talk about Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining as a tool for sustainable development, solving really the greatest challenges that we face as society today. Um, and then also something that I like to call the enabling infrastructure trilemma, uh, which I'll explain in just a moment. Um, and then if you're all familiar with the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, how does Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining fit into this? How is Bitcoin mining in some ways the silver bullet of sustainable development in Africa and around the world? Um, Bitcoin does not solve everything, which might get me canceled a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Really quickly talk about, you know, the work that I do and, you know, how we can help anybody that's interested. So for those that are not familiar with the sustainable development goals, they're basically 17... Uh, pathways to make the world a better place that have been outlined by the UN. Um, but really importantly, and something we don't talk about enough about, is a lot of these goals are interdependent on each other. So, for example, you know, good health and well-being is reliant on access to clean water and sanitation, which is reliant on access to clean and affordable energy, which is reliant on no poverty, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and today, the world really runs on three types of this enabling infrastructure that I just mentioned, right? These systems that enable us to, you know, see our potential and develop our potential. The world runs on energy, internet, and money. Meaning I need to be able to, uh, you know, do work through energy. I need to be able to transmit value across space and time with money. And I need to be able to transmit information across space and time using the internet. So first I'll talk a little bit about energy poverty. Phil really just kind of explained everything I need to explain. Probably don't even need to talk about this. Um, but an interesting, uh, an interesting facet of that graph that Phil had just shown is that the places in the world where you have the lowest access to energy and the highest costs of power tend to be the places that have the most renewable energy potential. So if you look at uh, the share of populations with access to electricity, I actually think this graph is a little bit outdated. But for the most part, as you can see, uh, Global South, you know, Latin South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, these are the places where you have the lowest rates of electricity access. I believe in the African continent, it's around 600 million. But the Gridless team can tell me. Yeah, 600 million. Um, and as you all know, you need energy to do everything. You need energy to run lights, water filtration, to cook your food. You need energy to thrive in the world today. Also, the access to be able to, the, the ability to transmit value across space and time, right? We all know how important that is. You know, Africa is really leading the way in terms of uh, Bitcoin adoption organically because it has the real use case here. You know, I come from the United States. We take for granted our, you know, uh, financial privilege all the time. You know, our currency gets debased, but not quite as much as it is around the world. Um, but in reality, 
about half of the world's population is either unbanked or underbanked, meaning they either have zero access to financial services or limited access. And even where I'm from in the United States, about one in five Americans is underbanked. In Africa, it's about, this is also a little bit outdated. I think today it's around 55%. But still, that means you have nearly half the population that does not have access to financial services. You're not able to make payments. You're not able to send money. Um, you know, each country for its own reason and in its own way. Um, but to have a, a financial system today, you also need it to be digital, um, which is why I now come to the digital divide, something that we don't appreciate about Bitcoin and its dependence on other types of enabling infrastructures. If you think about Bitcoin as a financial inclusion technology, if the entire world today went to a Bitcoin standard, which would be awesome, there are still over 2.6 billion people around the world today, many of whom, as you can see, live in Africa, that would not be able to access this technology. So we all talk about, oh, how incredible Bitcoin is for sustainable development, how it can you know, save the world. But if, if we're not also connecting people to the you know, internet, if we're not also connecting people to the energy system, then we're leaving them in the dark. And I think we're doing a, dis a disservice to ourselves and to, and to everybody else around the world. And so, I, and this is with the exception of some really awesome innovations I've seen out there, like Manchakura, I don't know if anybody from the, from the team is here, but really phenomenal work and changing the world, really exciting. You can give them a little uh, clap if, if you're around. Um, but so we need these three types of enabling infrastructures to work together. You need energy, internet, money, and you can't solve them one at a time like the way a lot of folks at the UN and these other organizations do. You need to solve them all simultaneously. Because you can't have energy infrastructure without internet and monetary infrastructure. You can't have monetary infrastructure without internet and energy infrastructure, so on and so forth. And so, you probably know where I'm going with this, but I believe Bitcoin could be the, the unlock for this uh, enabling infrastructure trilemma. If we can solve energy, internet, and money all at the same time, we now have the potential to help people you know, unlock their best selves, their most sustainable lifestyles, to grow, to thrive, economic development in a way that's you know, like un unlike anything we've ever, we've ever seen before. Um, and so is Bitcoin the, really the silver bullet? Um, I was actually gonna use that uh, graphic that Phil showed in his last slide to show that uh, across the African continent, and I don't know if you can see, this is just solar, but the most renewable energy potential in the world is all in Latin South America, Africa, South and Southeast Asia. But today, we're not, or I should say in the past, we weren't able to tap into this energy. In fact, most of the time, you know, Western economies, we come in, we extract resources, and then we build our own clean energy infrastructure at home. But why should we be building all this clean energy in Texas, in the United States, when we can be building it here. And the work that uh, you know, Gridless and Gamma, and I encourage anybody who's interested in Bitcoin mining to reach out to them, but the work that they're doing to use Bitcoin mining as a catalyst for clean energy development is going to unlock all these other types of infrastructure that enable us, us all to thrive. And so Bitcoin sits at the center of this infrastructure trilemma. This is why I think that Bitcoin is going to be the greatest tool for sustainable development. It's gonna help more lives than any other technology we've seen in recent history. And some of you may already know this. I know uh, Phil talked about this a little bit already, um, but why, why can Bitcoin do this? How come it's able to unlock all of this stranded power? Um, and maybe I'll say a really quick story, but about seven years ago or so, uh, a really terrible hurricane came through the, uh, the Caribbean in Latin America, and it totally wiped out the grid of Puerto Rico, which is a, a territory of the United States. About three million people living there. Um, about 60 people died, tragically, in the hurricane, but about 5,000 people died after the hurricane as a result of energy and access, which nobody talks about. Um, after this, I went to go work for uh, President Trump, then President Clinton, trying to figure out how do we build out clean energy infrastructure for Puerto Rico? How do we, how do we rebuild the grid? 
how come they don't already have a resilient and clean electricity system? And the greatest challenge is, with renewable energy being intermittent, meaning I can't control when the sun shines, when the wind blows, there's no way to sop up, to balance that supply and demand, right? Never before, we didn't know about Bitcoin back then, right? We were sitting in these, in these meetings thinking, if only there was some kind of technology that could monetize electricity into a globally liquid currency in a flexible, location agnostic, and interruptible way. Obviously, now we have Bitcoin. So the fact that it's interruptible, which means that I can turn on and off Bitcoin mining on a moment's notice. Um, all I'm doing is just not mining Bitcoin, but as opposed to, say, a factory or uh, some other kind of business, if I turn it off, then it could like ruin the process, it could break things. Bitcoin mining can go from 500 megawatts to zero with no problem, little to no problem. Uh, Bitcoin mining is also location agnostic. All you need is internet access, um, which means that you can basically seek out energy wherever it is. So right? I no longer have to rely on, the, on transmission, distribution. I can go find uh, a really sunny place, a really uh, heavy river. I can find methane that's being trapped somewhere. Um, Bitcoin mining is also incredibly flexible, which basically means that I can ramp up, ramp down really quickly, really easily, um, to essentially be a perfect customer to the grid. And then Bitcoin mining also, the fact that it requires internet infrastructure, it also promotes the development of, of internet access, right? So it concurrently solves this, this digital divide challenge that's going to help unlock Bitcoin's potential to, to alleviate uh, financial exclusion. Um, really quickly, I'll talk about Ghana as a case study. Uh, this is my first time here, by the way, and uh, so people can tell me if I'm wrong, people can, can uh, fact check me, call me out. Um, but looking at Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining as a sustain sustainable development unlock, solving that infrastructure trilemma here in Ghana, there's a few interesting uh, data points that we can like, kind of look through. About 85% of Ghanaians have access to electricity, which, by the way, is actually extremely high uh, compared to the rest of the continent. Um, really great, but 85%, that means 15% of the population either has little to no access to electricity. Which, by the way, we're, not, we're talking about uh, energy access, not fuel poverty, which is basically when energy is too expensive. Um, about 68% of Ghanaians also have access to the internet, which is relatively high, but it, and that was about, I think, 30% just a couple of years ago, so really well done. Um, and then the banked population is about 50 58%. So about 40% of Ghanaians also are, are either unbanked, underbanked, uh, don't have access to financial services. And if we look at the clean energy potential in Ghana, Ghana has a relatively high amount of you know, natural gas reserves and so uh, sizable energy production here. But you can see there's a massive amount of solar radiation, of hydro in the south, um, you know, wind power along the coast has amazing potential, but we have yet to develop it. I don't know if anybody was at the uh, restaurant the other night when we kept getting you know, blackouts and brownouts. Um, we want to create more energy production. We want an energy abundant society, uh, like what Phil was saying. There's also an interesting point about methane, which we don't have time to really get into, but uh, Ghana is actually one of the founding members of what's called the Global Methane Pledge. Methane is a, an extremely potent greenhouse gas that's vastly you know, exacerbating climate change. Ghana can really lead on mitigating methane, um, both you know, from landfills and from the oil and gas production uh, in the country. Ghana could be a pioneer, a real, a real leader across the continent in terms of methane mining. Um, about two-thirds of Ghana's energy supply comes from oil and gas. Uh, there's, I believe, a significant amount of flaring. I think Ghana could actually lead places like the U.S. in terms of uh, uh, what's called zero routine flaring, basically eliminating this, this emission of methane gas uh, across the country. Um, and then landfills uh, also cause a lot of health challenges across the country. Uh, basically, you have um, these dumps that uh, produce gas, produce pollutants, people breathe it. It causes all sorts of... Uh, respiratory challenges. Bitcoin mining can literally help people's health. Um, 
A few points, though, I want to make a little bit of like a cautionary tale about Bitcoin mining. Um, and this might be a spicy comment, but Bitcoin mining does not solve every single problem. It is not perfect. It's a technology, like any technology. It does a lot of incredible things, and there's things that it can't do. And I think as we're trying to promote adoption, we should just recognize that. Um, so for one, and we had this uh, discussion on a panel yesterday, but with all of this abundant clean energy potential, one thing that I worry about is if all of these big, ma you know, massive Bitcoin miners come in and they say, wow, there's incredible energy potential in you know, Kenya and Ethiopia and across the continent, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna gobble up the power. I wanna make sure that anybody who's coming in to help develop energy resources follows the gridless model, right? How do you work with the local community? How do you ensure you're not just extracting resources, mining Bitcoin, and then that's funding some guy that looks like me you know, out in the United States, right? How do we, how do we make sure that this becomes uh, African sustainable development, that we, we grow the economy here, that we enable people to thrive here? Um, what I also think is important is how can we use data, transparency, storytelling? How do we show the world like what's happening here? I think at the third African Bitcoin conference next year, we should bring uh, heads of state, we should bring industry leaders from around the world and show them exactly what's going on here. I think that'd be amazing. Um, we'll probably bust all the FUD immediately. Um, and then in terms of governance, I know one of the big issues is how do you work with uh, uh, local stakeholders, either you know IPPs or independent power producers, um, grid operators, how do you work with local governments? Um, how do you ensure that all this stuff is kind of done the right way? Uh, because I work for a company, I should briefly talk about that. I know I'm short on time. Um, so I work for Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol. Essentially what we're trying to do is incentivize the use of clean energy resources in Bitcoin mining. Um, we want to promote adoption. We want to get more money into Bitcoin. We want to bust all the FUD, use data and transparency to show that Bitcoin mining can actually be one of the greatest clean energy technologies in the world. Um, just to quickly talk about what we're doing, I think uh, yesterday somebody had mentioned that about 1% or a little less than 1% of global hash rate is currently in Africa. I wanna get that to 5% in the next few years, so work with me to make that happen. Um, most of the hash rate that we work with is in the United States, a little bit in Europe and Latin America. Um, today, we work with about 15% of global hash rate, sort of, of all Bitcoin mining. Probably going to grow to like 30 to 50% by mid next year. Um, that includes, you know, publicly traded miners, kind of global Bitcoin miners that are doing everything from nuclear to methane, solar, hydro, what have you. Um, yeah, so really quickly about that. Um, I know I'm short on time. So maybe I'll just really quickly put my info up here. Uh, what I would love to say to all of you is if you want to help develop uh, clean energy Bitcoin mining across the continent in your, your home country, your hometown, let's talk about it. Let's make it happen. Um, we, I truly believe that Bitcoin mining can solve so many of society's problems, uh, especially that enabling infrastructure trilemma. I want everybody to thrive. Energy abundant future. Um, yeah, and let's make Africa a pioneer of technology in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you.